I am happy to be with you all this morning. Yesterday was Veterans Day. Today we have visitors among us, so behave yourselves. Doesn't look like you got it. There you go. Um, we're going to be exploring a passage this morning that I am quite excited about, but it's going to be demanding of us. So hang on. What I want to do is I want to read this passage to us, and then we'll pray and dive right in. Uh, some of you know, I, uh, because of what I do, I occasionally speak, and, and this actually marks the start of a new project. I'm doing a theology of the Christian life, and I can't explain to you what's going on here, but I'll just tell you this is a little snippet of part of what I'm thinking. So with that said, I want to read to you from God's Word. This comes from Matthew 26. I'm going to read verses 6 to 13. Here are the reading of God's Word. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask, a very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? Uh, for this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, whatever this gospel, whenever and wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Please pray with me. Father, we commit this time to you Confident not in ourselves, not in the speaker, nor our ability to listen, but confident in the presence and power of your spirit. We want to be faithful. Make us so. In the name of the risen King, we pray. Amen. Have you ever had one of those uh, experiences where you think you see something clearly and then you realize you don't? We, Tabitha and I, years ago lived in Orlando and once in a while we'd go canoeing in the swamps and you'd you'd see this log and you're pretty sure it's the eyes of an alligator and then it's not, right? And I remember, you've probably seen this kind of thing, I remember on YouTube seeing this video and there was this guy and he looked very disheveled, looked kind of homeless, you know, just didn't look great. And he's walking on the side of the road, it's kind of like in Hollywood, and this, this gorgeous woman is walking the other way and he tries to stop and talk to her. And she is not interested. So she keeps walking. And just as she starts to walk on, you know, a Lamborghini, $200,000, $250,000 Lamborghini pulls up and stops. And out of the Lamborghini comes this guy just dressed until he just looks amazing. And she stops. And she starts, to, she starts to address this guy. And he walks right past her and takes the keys to the car and drops them in the homeless looking guy's hands and says, here you go, boss. And he walks away. And now she's very interested. And he leaves. You see, the reality is sometimes things are not how they appear at first glance. And that is part of what I want us to think about today with this passage. Because looks can be deceiving. I don't know about you, but how often, my, I have heard it quite often, that this statement from Jesus where he says, the poor you will always have with you, kind of used as a way to marginalize and minimize the church's call to the poor. In fact, let me not make it abstract, let me make it personal. I will confess to you that there is a time in my life when that's exactly how I would use it. People would talk about poverty in the church, I'd be like, you know what? Listen, the poor you're always going to have with you, but Jesus. And in fact, if you start to focus on the poor, you're going to lose Jesus. You're going to lose the gospel. No, 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 Jesus says, you're poor. You're always going to have the poor with you. Focus on me. Well, I just have to tell you, let's look again. And I have to tell you, I'm very excited because what we're going to find when we dive deep is something that's beautiful and faith-filled 
something that's life-giving and hopeful and completely Christ-centered. So I want to talk about three things today. I want to say, look again. The remote's not super friendly here. Look again, poverty and a beautiful thing. Look again. In Matthew 26, verse 11, here we read, and it's in red letters, so it's got to be true, right? It says, the poor you will always have with you. But before we say anything else, I want us to be utterly clear what Jesus is not saying. He is not saying that the poor, the needy, the marginalized, the hurting are optional for us, for God's people. Now, you might ask, how do you know that? And I could give you a bunch of Bible verses and stuff like that, but let me make it real simple. The passage we're reading is at the beginning of Matthew 26. Right before Matthew 26, I know this will be impressive for you math students, is Matthew 25. And the end of Matthew 25, in red letters, is Jesus telling an amazing story about the sheep and the goats. I don't know how familiar you are with that story. He could have made it very short, but he tells it in a long way. And it's this very sobering story. And the story of the sheep and the goats is on the judgment day, the sheep will be on his right side and the goats on the left. And when you read what Jesus says about it, it's stunning. If you don't bring anything else into the passage, what Jesus says is what separates the sheep and the goats, remember? What you did to the least of these. Did you visit the prisoners? Did you care for the orphan, the, the vulnerable, the weak, the marginalized? That's, that's what's represented when he talks about that. That happened in Matthew 25, and now all of a sudden, we're in Matthew 26. And Jesus says, the poor you will always have with you. What's going on there? Well, when Jesus says this line, there is little doubt he is directly alluding to Deuteronomy 15.11. And this is my guess, you don't know this. This is so fun to start to explore. Now, this is just an aside. You know, I know there's always movements like, have you heard of red letter Christians? Or people say, I'm, we're a New Testament church. I don't know what that means. That's problematic, just so you know. You can't understand the red letters apart from the Hebrew Bible. You can't understand who Jesus is and what he is doing apart from the Old Testament. So in light of that, let's actually look at what Jesus is alluding to. New batteries, people. All right. Here's Deuteronomy 15.11. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. But here is the rest of the verse. Therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in the land. This is one of those moments just from the beginning, you go, hmm, maybe more is going on here than I realized. You see also what's going on is the context is it's a sabbatical year. That's what Deuteronomy 15, this is not a Bernie Sanders thing. I don't care about Bernie Sanders. It was supposed to be funny, whatever. So <laughs> Deuteronomy 15, some of you, have, I've lost you now. You're either happy about Bernie, you're really angry about Bernie, you forgot everything I'm talking about. Deuteronomy 15 is all about the sabbatical year where God's people were supposed to re- uh, grant a release to their brothers and sisters in debt. And earlier in Deuteronomy 15, verse 4, it's stunning. In the same chapter, this is actually what we read. But there will be no poor. This is actually what it says earlier. There will be no poor among you. For the Lord your God will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess. And then it has this conditional statement. If only, if only you will strictly obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all the commandments that I command you today. That chapter begins by saying there should be no poor among you. But should it happen, as the chapter goes on, should that somehow develop, 
In verse later we read that you should give freely, that your heart should not be grudging, that you should give to those so the Lord will bless all of your undertakings. Some of you are, are, uh, go to church here in Chattanooga at a place called New City Fellowship. It's a great church. And at New City, um, when I was an elder then, I'm sure they still do this, when you become a member of New City Fellowship, one of the vows, one of the promises we make to you as a church is that as a member of this church, you will not starve and you will not go without shelter. You ever been in a church that makes a promise like that? They're like, no, we don't need that kind of promise. That might be a, a sign of an issue for us. But that's another conversation. No, 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 it doesn't, doesn't say that everyone will have the same amount, but there will be no poor. There will be none without shelter. People say, well, God, I don't know why you do that, because if you do that, you might get a lot of people coming to church just so they'll get food and shelter. Kind of sounds like Acts to me. I got no problem with that. May God make our problem that everyone's trying to get into our churches because we're so generous. No, no, look again. Jesus cares deeply about poverty. So we need to talk about poverty. We need to talk about poverty. You see, the poor, the needy, the vulnerable, the destitute, why are they so significant to God in Scripture? A lot of you know this, some of you don't. Here's a challenge for you. If you, if you find this stuff kind of you know, like, I don't know, this kind of sounds, you know, democratic or political or whatever, do me a favor, and I'll talk to any of you, but do this first. Get a new Bible, get a yellow highlighter, and start in Genesis and read through Revelation, and you highlight everywhere it talks about the poor, the orphan, the widow, the marginalized, the vulnerable, the needy, the destitute, and then when you come and we'll talk, we'll just look at how yellow your Bible is. It's there. But I'm just going to focus on one passage to help us understand, because if we understand Isaiah 1, we will better understand Matthew 26. I don't know when the last time you read Isaiah 1 is, but it's one of these kind of uncomfortable things, because out of the gates, God and Isaiah, I mean, the beginning of the book, God is upset. This isn't one of these, you're doing great. Here's verse 3 of Isaiah, chapter 1. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people do not understand. He goes on to say, you've forsaken the Holy One of Israel. Do you get what's going on? He says, the asses know who their master is, and you don't have a clue. You don't have a clue. You don't know who your master is. God tells his people here to listen, to listen again. And it goes on and says stunning things because it talks about how they're offering sacrifices. They're giving prayers. They're honoring the Sabbath. They're doing all of these things. And then in Isaiah 1 verse 14, all these good Christ, or, you know, Hebrew rituals Honoring to God, here's what Yahweh says. My soul hates them. They have become, this is God talking. Your prayers, your sacrifices, your incense, they have become a burden to me. And I am weary of bearing them. And in fact, verse 15, we always talk about, I talk about, God will hear your prayers, don't worry, he's always, but in Isaiah 115, God says, I will not listen to your prayers. Your hands are bloody. Now, sometimes people read Isaiah 1 and how strong it is, and they're like, yeah, you know what really upset God? He's really upset because they're just to totally formal. Their worship is too formal, and God wants more spontaneity. He wants more spunk in his people, right? <laughs> Let's be clear. God being upset in Isaiah 1 has nothing to do with the formality of the worship here. Who is the one who told them to honor the Sabbath? Who's the one who told them to offer prayers and incense and sacrifices? God did. The problem is not the formality. So then, after he's made this case... You read these words in Isaiah 1, 16 and 17. 
God says, wash your hands. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of, the de of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. And at this point, you go, okay, how do I wash my hands? How do I seek to do good? How do I stop doing evil? Well, he answers it. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless and plead the widow's cause. Isn't that amazing? What upset God was that they were doing these rituals that God gave while separating themselves from those who were most needy. And it was distorting everything. The very next, the very next verse is one many of you know. Isaiah 118 says, God says, come now, let us reason together. You ever heard that before? Now, I don't know about you, but I was a philosophy major in, in college, and then I did philosophy graduate work, and whenever I'd hear that text used in Christian circles, it was always in terms of apologetics. Come, let us reason today, together. Yet, let's, let's use philosophy. I'm all for philosophy. I'm all for careful thinking. That has nothing to do with what Isaiah is saying. God is saying to Israel, come now, let us reason together because you're being unreasonable. You don't know who you are. And it has distorted your view of who I am and what I am doing. God is saying by, by engaging in divinely given religious practices, and separating those from actual care for those in need, God's not, God's not just ma mad about some, you know, not doing some social program. It's so much bigger than that. He's upset because he knows by not connecting worship and the vulnerable, it distorts our theology. It distorts our worship. It cultivates idolatry. And God will have None of it. Come now, let us reason together. All you and I have is a gift from God. You and I can do nothing apart from the Creator Lord. None of us. Whether we eat or enjoy a festival, our sins can't be forgiven. We can't be sustained apart from Him. Only God can take our the, the stained clothing of, of red and make it white as wool. Come now, let us reason together. Isaiah 1 is simply a reminder of how problematic our practice can be when we neglect the needy. We don't have time to get into this. You can look at Figure and I's book on Becoming Whole. But really, in Scripture, you kind of have four examples of the way poverty works out. There's poverty in our relationship to God, poverty in our relationship to our neighbor, poverty in how we relate to the earth, and even poverty in how we understand ourselves. And, and that's the depth of the poverty. But for whatever strange reason, when we have material wealth, we very easily lose sight of all those forms of poverty. And God is saying, you need to be with those who are needy because, not because you're not, but because you start to believe the myth that you're not. Attending to the needs of the poor, the needy, the vulnerable keeps us all mindful of our need and dependence upon God's grace, his love and provision. And listen, beloved, you and I never graduate from that. All right, so let's talk about a beautiful thing. I kind of forgot about this. A beautiful thing. This is where we can start to put pieces of the puzzle together. Because this is really amazing. So Jesus shows frustration back in the scene in Matthew 26. Here you have this woman. He's, he's frustrated with the disciples because you have this woman, quote, wasting expensive oil. This, this oil could have been used to sell and give to the poor. Right? Now, make sure you're listening because we often trash the disciples like, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Well, here is a good example. It seems like they were listening. They were thinking about the sheep and the goats. 
And they're like, what are you doing, woman? That's worth a lot of money. Sell it so we can give to the poor. We want to be sheep. So here's the stunning question for us in the beginning of Matthew 26. In the scene I read, who is the poorest person in the scene? Who is the neediest person in the scene? Many of you have memorized this verse. It's lovely. 2 Corinthians 8 9, Paul says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by your poverty he might become rich. We love that quote. It's very nice. It's like, oh, that's very, he came from heaven to earth. You know that thing? But when I just said, who is the neediest? Who is the poorest? And I'm telling you, it's Jesus. How does that feel? Do you think Jesus ever became needy? He ever became poor? Where is Jesus in this scene? In this scene, he is in the home of Simon the leper. Now, again, we read the Bible so fast, like, Simon the leper, da-da-da. Whatever. First of all, if he still has leprosy, they can't be in his house. So that's interesting. We're not told how it's healed. Did Jesus do it? What happened? But here's what we do know. Simon is still known by shame. Whatever you feel most shame about, use your first name and slap it on there as a last part. And whenever anyone sees you, that's what they call you. Judith the blank, Simon the leper. That's the home where Jesus is. Simon is identified still by his uncleanliness. Now the scene I read to you and the sheep and the goats has just a few verses in between as a transition that Matthew uses. And gospel writers always are doing things intentionally. And Matthew transitions here And here's part of what he says in Matthew 26, uh, 1 to 5. We read that in the palace of the high priest, you have these priests organizing a way to kill Jesus. Where are they at? In a palace. You have the priests who are supposed to be associated with God in a palace plotting to kill the Son of God, and you have the true Messiah in the home of a leper. But it gets better than that. We read about, quote-unquote, a woman, unnamed. In ancient Near Eastern world and first century, I mean, you don't get, this is, this is, you know, she has no power. She has no, you know, an unnamed woman. And we read that she comes in with an alabaster flask a very expensive ointment and pours it on her head. And as we said, the disciples are angry. Don't you remember the sheep and the goats? She's being wasteful. We could use it for the poor, right? And remember how Jesus responds? Why are you troubling this woman? Why are you troubling her? Or you can translate, why are you hurting this woman? She's done a beautiful thing for me. For the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. There's some beautiful things I'm going to show you. You see, she understood that Jesus was like a king. In the Hebrew Bible, we know the anointing of the head with oil associated with king, and she's seen something here. She gets it, but not totally. And Jesus, you ever have a good teacher who takes your lame question and makes it good? (laughs) Right? Or your lame comment and makes it good? Or your friend who enters into the awkwardness and makes it okay? It's kind of what Jesus is doing here. He takes her well-meaning effort and reinterprets her action and helps us better understand who he is and what he's doing. 
He takes her anointing. He receives it as preparation for burial. Where is Jesus going right after this? He's going to the cross. He's going to the grave. He is about to face great injustice. Jesus is about to face real humiliation, real isolation, real abandonment. He is to have everything stripped from him. He is to go to the experience and ultimate end of poverty. It's death. And Jesus, who's in deep need here, has an unnamed woman care for her. And in doing more, so she does more than she ever dreamed, right? I don't know if you know this, but just as an aside, the gospel writers do this intentionally. All the significant moments in the life of Jesus, his birth, right, the Christmas story, a woman is crucial in that. Here, preparing for his death, it is a woman doing it. The first people to testify to his resurrection are women. Yes, the center of all those stories is Christ, but don't miss the fact that key to the story of redemption are women. God loves to use women to shine the bright light on his presence and action. Now back to this episode. Right before the sentence that Jesus gives from Deuteronomy, the allusion to Deuteronomy, here's the verse right before it. Listen, Deuteronomy 15, verse 10, 11. You shall give to the poor freely, and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him. Because for this, and as you hear this, I want you to hear, clearly Jesus has been meditating on this text. He is living it. He is taking comfort from it. For this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all you undertake, for there will never cease to be poor in the land. Jesus here alludes to Deuteronomy both to comfort and strengthen himself, but also for those of us paying attention to help us see the cosmic significance of what he's doing. Here Jesus is freely opening his heart as he goes to the cross. He goes for the joy set before him to give to the poor, to us, and God will bless all of his work. Jesus is about to undertake the unspeakable, to face the darkness of sin, death, and the devil. He who knew no sin is about to become sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, the great king, becomes completely and utterly poor. So poor that it takes Simon the leper and an unnamed woman to reach all the way down and care for him. Sorry for all the crackles. But they're like sheep and they care for him. And the good news will be proclaimed in all the world. It's good news because he doesn't just die, but he will rise. And he lives even now. And we're supposed to tell her story wherever we do. Let me conclude. She's done a beautiful thing. She's done a beautiful thing watching and listening to her and Jesus. We discover something that's a great surprise. And it is not that Jesus' presence makes the poor insignificant. No, 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 no. The surprise in this passage is that Jesus becomes the embodiment of the poor. He becomes the embodiment of the poor. She is not disobeying the sheep and the goats. She is the one who recognizes no one is needier here than Jesus. She cares for the poor, only here the vulnerable, the prisoner, the stranger, the hungry, is Jesus himself. Jesus becomes the poorest ever. Martin Luther once said, Jesus on the cross is the greatest sinner. Here you can say, Jesus becomes the most poor person ever because he's taken on the whole poverty of the world. Only in the Messiah are we made fully aware of the true nature of our own poverty and the true depth of divine grace. Jesus gave everything to the poor, his own life. 
the poor you will always have with you. That is not meant to downplay the poor. Beloved, that is an invitation, not an excuse. It is an invitation for us to be with those who will help us better see who we really are. Let me conclude with this. A couple weeks ago, Tabitha and I happened to be in a setting where there was someone who had dealt with serious addiction and poverty and jail for decades. And now he was helping homeless people. And he had been homeless for a long time. And as he prayed, it caught my attention because I was thinking of this passage. He said, Lord, thank you that the poor you will always have with us. And I realized for him it was hopeful. Because I know some of you are like, I, Jesus feels so far away. I feel like God never hears my prayer. That man knew he was going to meet Jesus that day. He knew where to find him. And all of us are poor. Dysfunctionally rich people are poor. Your neighbor, your roommate is poor. All of us are poor. But until we see it, we live a myth. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you for good news, not bad news. We thank you that you love us, that you do not mock our poverty, but you enter into it. We thank you that for you, love is not a theory or an abstraction. We thank you that the gospel is real. Lord, protect us from guilt and give us the freedom to experience and love your love moving in and through us to others. We who have experienced the depth of your love, help us carry that love to our neighbors. We pray all this confidently because you, King Jesus, reign and rule now. And so we want to reflect and participate in your kingdom now. Amen.